Thank you for listening to Organic News here on Awake Radio, where we try to give you news that is organic. Welcome again to another Tuesday evening of Organic News here on Awake Radio. Uh, And tonight, it's like a a little bit surprising. I was having a little bit uh, just connecting with uh, Dr. Dahlia Waspi on uh, Facebook is how I was corresponding and asking her to be on Awake Radio. And sometimes, you know, people, we don't get each other's messages. And so at the last minute, I wasn't sure if she was going to be able to join us. And then she was, and I'm really, really excited. Um, So I'm just going to read a little bit about who Dr. Dahlia Waspi, she's an internationally known speaker and activist, born in the United States to an American Jewish mother and an Iraqi Muslim father. She lived in Iraq as a child, returning to the United States at age five. After graduating from Swarthmore College with a BA in biology in 1993, she earned her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. Dr. Waspi has made two trips to Iraq to visit her extended family since the 2003 shock and awe invasion, including a three-month stay in Basra in the spring of 2006. She has brought her eyewitness account of her life under occupation to over 200 audiences in 22 United in 22 of the states. Capitol Hill in DC, Ontario and British Columbia, Madrid, Spain in 2007 and the third international Iraq conference in Berlin, Germany in March of 2008. Based on her experience, Dr. Waspi is speaking out in support of immediate unconditional withdrawal of American forces from Iraq and the need to end the occupation from the Nile to Euphrates. So Dr. Dahlia Waspi, welcome to Organic News here on Awake Radio. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Your talk is so powerful. It, it's, it's incredible. And I just, you know, want to let you talk a little bit, and then I want to play it. It's about 15 minutes long. Yes. And um, there's there's one video where I just tried to look for it um, on a, on a site, and it was called "We Are the Terrorists." America is the terrorist. And then when I went to click on it, the video wasn't there. So I don't think, I think there, it's another video that I'm going to be playing. Um, yeah, Life in Iraq Under U.S. Occupation is the one. Yes, and the, actually the, the other video is an excerpt from this one. So this, this one's more complete. So I'm glad the other one didn't come up for you. <laughs> okay, so just briefly, um, so you're a doctor. You became a doctor, and then you obviously saw this need to, to, to discuss what's going on in Iraq to be, to take you away from being a doctor. Yeah, what happened is, uh, well, they give you, when you graduate from medical school, which I did in 1997, that's, that's when you've earned your MD, your medical degree, but you have to do residency training to be proficient in a certain area of medicine or OBGYN or pediatrics or another specialty. Uh, And I had continued. First, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, That was a big mistake for me. Uh, That was a very difficult time uh, to be a surgery resident, as it is for most people, but uh, I was really unhappy. Uh, And uh, I switched to anesthesia. And Uh, It was in uh, 2000, uh, well, of course, the events of uh, September 11th, 2001 uh, took place when I was uh, in my anesthesia residency. I was actually at Georgetown University Hospital, so I was close to, uh, relatively geographically close to the Pentagon, um, but not really impacted uh, medical-wise by uh, by, uh, an influx of patients from what happened at the Pentagon. 
Uh, but at this time, soon the next month, o October 2011, we had invaded Afghanistan and were bombing Afghanistan. And then, then came the buildup to the invasion of Iraq. And uh, there were a few things going wrong in my life at that time. And uh, the huge hypocrisy of, of what my government was doing and about to the, the massacre it was about to launch on Iraq while I was working in a very elite uh, atmosphere and I, my tax dollars were being used to fund uh, the suffering of, of people thousands of miles away. And it was a huge crisis of conscience for me and uh, essentially I had a nervous breakdown. Uh, and took leave from my uh, from my residency training, and uh, as it turns out, I, I haven't gone back yet. Uh, but I took the opportunity. I had to look at myself and come to terms with what my life and, and was and how it was impacting people. And I took the opportunity to visit my family in Iraq in 2004 for three weeks, and then again, as you mentioned, uh, for three months in 2006. And after my first trip, I, uh, I felt an obligation to put a human face on the people at the other end of our weapons and missiles. So uh, I just started giving, basically giving uh, just uh, shows of my family photos from my visits, and it evolved into more political talks. And after my second trip, uh, I had the opportunity to testify on Capitol Hill and when that video got on the internet, that's when I got uh, more national attention uh, for speaking opportunities. And it really just developed from there. I really, I, I wish I could say it was a conscious choice to switch from medicine and become an activist and, and make, a, make a more... Uh, a more effective contribution to the planet and to humanity. Uh, it really just uh, sort of snowballed and came together on its own, and I feel very fortunate to have had the opportunities that I have. And so <clears throat> you are now a, a full-time activist. Is that correct? Yes, uh, because uh, until recently, Iraq has not been in the news, uh, and I, I'm, I'm American, I was born in New York, and uh, I live on the East Coast today, uh, and so I've, uh, I haven't had much of an opportunity to speak, actually, since uh, Obama was elected in 2008, I've only had a few talks here and there, so I've been working on a book, uh, and that's what I've been uh, spending my time doing, uh, and uh, the book is about my family, um, my uh, my diverse family background with uh, with uh, my father from Iraq on one side and my mom from New York on the other and she's the daughter of Holocaust survivors so I have that history of military occupation and uh, life-threatening circumstances on both sides and as a citizen of the nation that is responsible for crimes against humanity today I am screaming as loud as I can that uh, this is this is never a good thing and it doesn't matter whose whose flag is on the uniforms of the military of the occupying military and it doesn't matter who the people are who are being occupied it's it's a brutal ugly system and we should have evolved uh, beyond that at this point so I, I do my best to try to speak for both sides of my family um, to to have a more just world you know because it's just like so nice to hear someone just say it in plain english what's really going on i mean it's it's you you know and a few other people that are trying to get the truth about like what these wars are really about and there's there's so many people that are just you know for them and go along with it and 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 you know the soldiers that are also um i mean even though they're there and they see and they don't even agree or like what's going on. They somehow right. just, you, you know, they're, they're, the, the Ethan McCourt uh, soldier that was carrying, mm -hmm. you know, trying to, in, in the collateral murder video, mm -hmm. you know, just talking about, like, how many of the soldiers are just, you know, really, really afraid and they don't believe in, in what they're doing. They don't really respect the commander, but... 
you know, the, 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 you know this, it's like the sad reality is that people, they have nothing else. Like, I mean, they have no family. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, I just think of, you know, sometimes personal relationships or marriages where people, you know, they, they just stay in these um, unfulfilling situations and, and just any job because there's just nothing else and they, they have nowhere else to go or they just don't know where to go or what to do. But if they, you know, if they all or we all come together and, and you know, do activism, you know, we, we do have the potential, I, I believe, to to turn things around and, and just expose the, the, these, these lies. Absolutely. I, I think that analogy to, to the, just the very, the very nucleus of the family life is such an important one because I, that really, what you experience in your childhood tends to shape your outlook and how you interact with the rest of the world. Um, and uh, I, I think actually it's the same except for, uh, except for under the last regime in Iraq, there was mandatory military service. Here it's voluntary. But many of the people who, who join the U.S. military are joining uh, for the same reasons, uh, not everybody, but many, uh, for the same reasons that a young man, usually it's a young man, uh, would join a street gang. And I would argue that the, that the U.S. military is just a more elite gang um, that that commits the 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 greatest crimes uh, as Martin Luther King jr. said um, it's uh, if you don't have a positive home life if you don't have love and support at home you look for it elsewhere and there's this concept of the band of brothers uh, in in the military and this I know from uh, from my contacts who are uh, who became uh, anti-war veterans uh, that uh, it's it's not always there when the chips are down, but but they're looking for that kind of environment, that kind of support, and uh, and brotherhood. Um, and yes, there are women joining the military, but it's predominantly geared towards uh, towards young men. Uh, and this is, if we had that at an earlier point, if, uh, you know, all of us had that, that gift of uh, a loving and supportive family, it doesn't have to be your blood relatives, but that kind of uh, environment from early on, I agree with you. I think it would be, it would be a, a much different world that we lived in. And um, when the, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, it's okay. Yeah, I just wanted to... Um you know, because it sometimes, <laughs> I, you know, I got to be honest. Like it really scares me because it's 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 as if you know, just human beings, um, especially when they're young, that is seen, you know, just with dollar signs as a commodity, and the powers that be just want to use that and and exactly, you know, to con people to get over to make people, you know, do things like join the military or the police department. Um, uh, you know, and 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 then then when they do, and because people don't have that good family system and and have uh, like anywhere to go from the family, like you know, uh, a family that can actually maybe help them get somewhere, like go to medical school or whatever, and um, they feel so deprived and they really like want to feel um, that they you know they they just want to be somebody and work for. Uh, for honor and all those good things that the the military and sometimes the police department even and I think lots of jobs like lots of big corporations also do the same thing and they just take advantage of of the fact that people come from deprived uh, upbringings. Absolutely, um, and I you know there are. are are, there are people who are very genuine in their in their efforts. I mean, I was I was genuine in my desire to help people, and that's why I I went to medical school. That's one of the reasons why. But my experience in the medical system, uh, the system uh, was a lot like what I saw was a lot like an assembly line, and it was there were there were elements of inhumanity in it. And I think it's the same thing for a lot of young people 
who are, I mean, it's documented that uh, recruiters have told lies to their prospective recruits, um, that this concept of, you know, duty, honor, country, that this is this is not what you end up getting shipped overseas for. Uh, I mean, we were, sh- we were even, and, and I think to this day, there is National Guard, there are National Guard members serving overseas. I mean, this is, this is contrary to the, to the basic definition, and you're not defending your country, you're actually right. defending corporate interests. But but you can't get people to sign up for that. They you know you, if you go to the American public and say, look, we uh, we really want to control the flow of oil from from the region of Western Asia, and we want you to send your children to go kill and be killed for the sake of controlling oil. And people would say, are you nuts? We're not doing that. But after September 11th, 2001, the American people were, were put into a, a, a state of fear and told that, uh, you know, we need to, this is for self-defense, this is for our country, this is uh, because we were attacked. Um, there, the, the facts of the situation come out a long time later. And by that time, unfortunately, it's too late for thousands of young recruits in this country and over a million people overseas. So this is the real tragedy. And the, and the big winners are those members of government who have ties to these corporations and those CEOs who are laughing all the way to the bank because they're certainly not sending their children to go kill and be killed for the profits they're making. This, this is the big lie. Uh, and if we could, if we could get, uh, if we could rectify that, um, and and tell people that their value is in who they are, not the uniform that they put on, um, I think that's a very uh, valuable lesson that we can pass pass on to the to the kids today, so that in another five, ten years, they are less susceptible to be convinced by the lies of a recruiter who who comes to to find them for the for to fill their ranks. Um, you know, it just seems that, you know, the military, I kind of posted this earlier, uh, you know, it's almost like it, it's just become like any other job um, where, right, people get involved because, they, you know, for the, right, the honor, the justice, like they think they're going and, and fighting, you know, terrorists and and protecting their country and then they get there and they basically just find out that it's you know just like any other job like it's a you know they're there for just going through motions maybe for like money or whatever um you know like 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 most people i kind of feel like experience when they go to work every day and um you know maybe the only reason why it really stands out when you join the military is because you know, it's so amped up about, oh, honor and, uh, you know, defending your country and, and being, you know, all you can be and all that stuff. And, and, and also because of, right, things like 9-11 and this urgency that people really believe that, you know, they're, they're going over there and, and protecting their country. And then when it just obviously, you know, they find out that it's not that, it's just like so much of a letdown. But... I feel that, you know, just anyone working for a company and they go to work every day and, and, and just, uh, you know, it might not be as sort of, um, intense as the military, but it's just more slow and gradual over time, but it ends up amounting to the same thing. I feel, you know, I I agree. I agree with you. Um, and uh, did I interrupt? I don't want to cut you off. No. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that you know we have to look at uh, we have to look at the impact of what we're doing and and whom we're working for. Um, I uh, I could see because of the situations I was in when I was working in medicine, I could see uh, the impacts of people making the wrong decisions. Um, I, there's an anecdote I have of uh, of a patient, uh, actually two patients who were uh, used for practice. Uh, for um, uh, their treatment was an opportunity for the doctor taking care of them to practice. 
uh, and um, I, I don't really care what the reality of the system is. This is uh, an elite group, uh, which is predominantly predominantly Caucasian, predominantly male, uh, predominantly privileged, who is taking advantage of a poor population, often a minority population, often an uneducated population, and this is the environment that I was training in. And so, so y most people, I think, just sort of take it take it in, take it for granted, not really understanding what's happening. But it was right in front of me, right in my face, uh, just the the inhumanity of what was being done. I think when you're working for a certain corporation, like for example, uh, any weapons manufacturer like Northrop Grumman or Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, um, just to name a few, uh, you may be, um, as it was, uh, like a like an Eichmann uh, who was just pushing papers, uh, but you're contributing to a system. Um, and those individuals, you usually are not exposed to to your ultimate victims. It, we're very insulated, especially in this country. Um, and uh, and I think that if we if we follow if we follow the impact of what each of us does, we have to look. Uh, you know, I am uh, I have a laptop. And uh, right now, I know that the the resources that were used to make my laptop uh, came from countries where the resources were stolen. Uh, so I live in a country that I have privileges based on what my government does. Um, so it's my obligation um, to uh, now. I can be, and I, I I can certainly be criticized for that participation. Uh, but I have to recognize what that impact is, and so um, I, when issues come up about uh, about individual countries in the African continent where resources are being stolen and the people and their communities are being are being raped and pillaged by uh, Western corporations, this is something we have to acknowledge that we don't need the latest uh, edition of of the latest technology. And um, we are we are five percent. The United States is five percent of the world's population, using twenty five percent of the world's resources. There's something very wrong with that. And each of us can examine our lifestyle and make an adjustment. Even the smallest change will have a ripple effect, like our like our daily our daily grind has a ripple effect around the world. We can do that in a positive way as well. I was thinking about that earlier when um, a friend sent me a link for an article about, it's called Google Wallet. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a, like some kind of new improved, you know, PayPal, like monetary transaction. And, um, you know, not that it's like so bad or anything, but I mean, I, I was just like having what you were just saying in mind as I was reading this article, because the person that wrote it, you know, just keeps talking about technology and, and the direction that technology is going and the young people and, you know, cryptocurrencies and things like that. And mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, exactly, I mean, you, you know, right, where, where does the, the, the supplies and, you know, come from in order to make these things? Um, I mean, or if I'm, if we're just so focused on technology so that we can have like monetary transfers and that we can just keep you know getting further and further in life rather than uh, you know be worrying about and helping the people that are being completely uh, you know you know crucified is kind of the only word that's like coming to my mind right now uh-huh like there's just not enough of a focus on really helping the disadvantaged as much as there are there is focus on this you know Google wallet and 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 you know just people wanting to get money and, and make money for themselves oh that's our that's our whole society here it's all about consumerism and uh, and it's all about we're all about winning it's a uh, be number one no matter who you step on to get there um, and it's a very it's a very dehumanizing atmosphere to come up in. And just if uh, if I refer back to our previous example of the military, when you join the military, um, again, having spoken to I'm not uh, I've never been associated with the military myself, but 
I have a number of friends who are, who are veterans and whom I met through my anti-war work. Um, the whole environment, the whole aspect of basic training is dehumanizing um, to, to strip you of, of your individuality and certainly to strip you of independent thought because that's, you can't command uh, a troop with, uh, with people thinking on their own and saying, no, I think maybe this would be better. You are supposed to follow orders, and that's it. And you, they make you see that you are, your own value is less. What matters the most uh, is the unit around you, and you don't want to let anyone else down. You don't want to interfere with uh, their well-being. And in order for everybody to, to maintain well-being, you have to follow orders and stay a unit. And this is why the, the U.S. military targets young people, um, because they're more susceptible to this kind of brainwashing, uh, where they lose their individuality and they lose their, uh, their, their value just as an independent human being. Uh, instead, you become part of a whole, just a, just a unit. Um, and when you are dehumanized, it is then easier for the individual to dehumanize others. And that's how people are trained to kill. And they see the enemy no longer as, as someone with a human life equal to their own human life because their own value is, is diminished. Um, they are, their lives are not as important as um, whomever the other may be is not as important as your own life or your buddy's lives or American lives and this is the this is a real problem we should be uh, we should be using one another to lift each other up um, maybe I'm getting too philosophical about it but in, we need a better mentality um, and we need to protect kids from that kind of uh, of brainwashing the same as as with any other gang um, it's going to result in personal harm personal injury and then injury and harm to those around you and then to people whom we might not ever even see uh, if, I, if I could just uh, mention uh, briefly the like I was a psych major when I went to school like I really <laughs> I got into, you know, just like kind of, you know, therapeutic type, uh, you know, 12-step program and, uh, you know, the, the family system and the dysfunctional family system was like, you know, my, I, I was so passionate about that subject. Um, and just recently I was reading a book that was recommended to me by Kit Gruel, who's part of a documentary on domestic violence called Private Violence, and the book is by Alice Miller, and it's called For Your Own Good, Hidden Cruelty, huh. Hidden Cruelty in Child Rearing. And I was just reading the part about, uh, you know, wonderful Adolf Hitler and how he grew up and how he was just abused mercilessly by his father every day. And... When he was 11, he was nearly beaten to death by the man. And, you know, his mother, of course, wasn't able to do anything to protect him. He had no outlet. and He wasn't allowed, you know, to express the rage. You know, he's not even allowed to talk about what's happening to him. And, you know, so, of course, like, you know, and his father was, um, you know, got to be, I think, in some kind of high position uh, militarily, or in some service, I'm off the top of my head. I just like forget what it what it was. But there was a, a push, you know, for him to you know have like this career. And so I think all of those things combined together, um, you know, Alice Miller is just talking about all these conditions put together. You know, led you know Adolf Hitler to take all those all that repressed rage and just take it out on the, the Jewish people because I, I believe she said in the book that his, fa his father was half Jewish. And so, you know, I, you know it, it's, it's really quite, um, you know, startling to say the least that, you know, what just disrespecting and abusing human beings which are, you know, part of nature. It, like, you know, I just, I kind of wrote a blog today and I, I I called it a, you know, abuse is pollution. So it, it's basically just like polluting 
when when especially young people when you're just completely taking advantage of young people it, it's like you're polluting their their psyche and using them for your own uh, means rather than that per, that child being able to to just be free Wow, that's an amazing analogy. Um, and uh, my only uh, or my major point of reference, uh, I read uh, in my own soul searching. Uh, I wish I'd been a psych major, but I was a bio major. Um, but I read, uh, I think it's the Dance of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller. And in in that publication, she talks about how. Um, how children who are abused by their parents uh, cannot, they cannot hold their parents responsible. And this is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, so don't, don't, uh, I don't mean to, no, it's mis, uh, to misquote her um, <laughs> or give the explanation, but uh, children cannot hold the parent responsible because uh, that's the person if anybody on the on their on the earth is supposed to love them, it's it's supposed to be your parents. So any kind of uh, abandonment or neglect gets transferred onto some other focus, and um, this is often she describes that this is often what happens when people join hate groups like like uh, the KKK or uh, I don't know that one's just the one uh, coming to mind but um, or any sort of channel where there is an other that is designated as the enemy and evil and that's where this anger and this rage as you said gets channeled um, if we if we look at uh, if we look at the history uh, after World War one Germany was humiliated and uh, if this description of uh, Adolf Hitler's personal experience was being humiliated by his father um, then the backlash comes when uh, when the child grows up and says I'm not going to be humiliated like this anymore and that was also sort of the mentality of um, if if my history is accurate uh, just the sort of the response how how the end of World War One helped create the uh, the atrocities of World War Two, and I think we can find that just in our you know that's the that's the macrocosm, and if we look at the microcosm exactly. and individual children and individual families, if if there can be healing on that level, or even you know even correction before the trauma takes place, that that changes that changes a life and affects a life, and I, I really that's a abuse as pollution i think that's a that's an a, amazing analogy wow. <laughs> i'm not used to people having that reaction to me when i speak so you know that's how i know that you're just like a really genuine person but you know i mean it, it just it makes sense to me and um you know it's like I, I i was so relieved just over the last few years because you know i was always reading about the dysfunctional family system and uh, John Bradshaw, again, he's another one of my favorite people, uh, his books I used to read a long time ago. But um, when it, uh, over the last few years, there's more talk about debt, and people are talking about debt more. And mm -hmm. I'm, really, I'm really glad about that because, um, again, like the ultimate debt is, you know, in your psyche, it's in your spirit, it's in your emotions, and we, I believe, you know, and, and just again in, in reading Alice Miller and For Your Own Good and reading about Hitler, I, I mean, people get put into just such a psychological and an emotional, spiritual debt when you are mistreated and abused as a child. And it's, it's such a deep deficit, I mean, that without, you know, without it being acknowledged and, and you know, some, some uh, reliable caring person that's there you know when the person is still young enough to be able to do something about it like once it gets uh, that debt gets perpetuated and the person just keeps getting older and I, I mean what what choice do you have but to turn out like a Hitler and I I really do believe that a lot of these big corporations and these people that are leading the, these corporations and all these tough commando guys that are in the military you know, truly came from families where they just didn't have their emotional needs met, 
and they got put in, you know, either they were humiliated because it's so, um, Alice Miller talked about in this book about how, like, Adolf Hitler was able to tap into so many people that were going through the exact same thing that, that he was in Germany at the time. And that's how he was able to get all these people to do his bidding for him and to, and to kill all these millions of Jews because there was so, like, ch you know, child abuse is just like normal parenting. And so he was able to basically get everyone who was abused, you know, together to liberate them and give them permission to unleash their rage out on the Jewish people. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also there's there's another aspect of it as well in terms of um, looking at, at at the population who joins the military. Um, and I don't have the figures for it. I'm really just talking about my own experience dealing with the um, uh, being involved with the the anti-war movement. Um, I think there's also an issue of the military selling manhood. Um, that if you, you know, if you join us, that's a real, and, and you, you work for us, you do what we do, that's a real show of your manhood. And for those who have been bullied, um, and uh, I would say probably mostly uh, f to men who have been, men and boys who have been bullied, and to women and girls who have uh, not had the... Um, the attention from their father that they that they needed, um, the love and attention. There is this uh, mentality to uh, to prove oneself. Um, I'll tell you that's a, that's one of the reasons that I I picked surgery as my specialty um, because I I have a younger brother and he he's ten years younger than me and I saw how happy my father was to have a son he had two daughters and then he had a son and uh, I know my father loved me and um, but I I wanted to be to him what his son was to him and part of trying to prove that was to go out and be the take on the the most masculine specialty I could find so that I, I put from my own experience so there's some sort of this lacking uh, as as you mentioned something we're trying to meet our needs in some way and so we become vulnerable to these outside forces um, but one of the biggest tragedies that uh, that I've witnessed um, are those veterans who you know they join the military wanting to help but wanting to prove oneself and then end up witnessing or participating in the the abuse uh, and great harm of others and this is this impacts them to this day we're talking about um, I don't I don't know how many Korea veterans are left but I've I've met and I'm friends with a number of Vietnam veterans who have been struggling for 30, 40 years to, uh, to, to make up for what they were involved in, not knowing what they were going to be involved in. We see the same thing happening with Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who now make up a quarter of the homeless population in this country. Um, there's a lot of substance abuse. Uh, a lot of families fall apart, so the children of these veterans um, end up missing out on the, the complete functional family family that they might have had otherwise it's a really it's it's a no matter which way you look at it there's a lacking and a need that hasn't been met and and you know the earlier that uh, the need is met uh, the better it is for the individual and I think for the society at large um, yeah I just wanted to respond you know you said that right the military it kind of sells uh, the public on on you know like what it is to be a man you know when you know the un unfortunate reality is it's kind of like like a pseudo man. It's not even like what a real man is. You know to go over to these countries and just you know kill innocent people. Like under, exactly. Yeah, under the guise of being a man. And they tell you you're going to be defending. You're defending your country, but uh, or you, you know. And there's this idea. There's typically this idea. It has come up. Um, it has come up so much with uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan, um, especially Afghanistan. But people get confused and apply it to Iraq as well. That we're going to help the women. 
the women are oppressed by those men over there and we're going to go help them with our M16s and our artillery shells. Now, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, this is the motivation. Um, so you're, you're talking about selling people on doing good um, when you end up participating in the opposite. And that's, uh, that's very hard for, for people to come to terms with. And that's why, that's why the suicide rate uh, among veterans is it's, it's considered, uh, it's been referred to as an epidemic with an estimated 22 veterans, I think that's the last figure I'm familiar with, 22 veterans uh, succeeding in taking their lives every day. Uh, but each day there are over 100 attempts. So this is, what, this is what we need to know. This is what young people need to hear about when the recruiters come saying, you're going to be defending your country, this is going to be honorable. If it's so honorable, you know, you know building schools and hospitals doesn't make you want to kill yourself. Something else is going on when you get deployed um, that, uh, that people need to pay attention to. Um, and, and, of course, they go and uh, recruiters and the military establishment, they go after young people who haven't been able to get an education because it's harder and harder to afford an education in this country today. Um, and if you don't have that ed education and you don't have... Uh, you're very young and you're not you're tra you're already trained not to question authority um, they are extremely vulnerable to to society's messages and that I consider that's one of my responsibilities as well as someone who's um, I'm not in my 20s anymore um, I don't know that I would want to be but um, uh, but I have that experience under my belt so it's my job my responsibility my obligation even to try to let people know what they're up against and then to change to shift the dynamic to shift the whole mindset um, of our society uh, so that we we are indeed providing help um, and not creating such devastation at home and overseas. Right. Um, last night I went, uh, Glenn Greenwald spoke at Carnegie Hall. I'm going to play um, the recording of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, at, at, in the second hour. But um, I, like, he talked about, you know, Edward Snowden and why Edward Snowden decided to, ex you know, expose the NSA with all these documents. And he said that, you know, Edward Snowden's answer was because, you know, I wouldn't be able to live, you know, for the rest of my life knowing what I know and that I didn't do something. Because, you know, because Glenn Gre Greenwald was talking about Edward Snowden and how, you know, he had this great career. I mean, he was. He was making a lot of money. He was living in Ohio. Sure. He's got to support a family and a girlfriend and all of this stuff. Like, why would he, uh, you know, you know, risk all of that and and you know expose the documents that he exposed and that was his response you know that knowing what he knew he wouldn't be able to live the rest of his life and and not had done something and it re it reminded me because when you were just talking about suicide of the veterans and everything I think uh uh, you know, somewhere along the line, you know, people have to make a choice. You know, you saw what you saw and you made a choice between, you know, going in the direction of being an activist for Iraq, you know, what, you know what, what, with that and then also um, what you saw in the medical profession. So, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere along the line, you have to choose which direction you're going to go in. And, and the, the unfortunate, you know, because, right, you can't get over on nature is my motto. And unfortunately, people that end up taking their lives, I mean, maybe they're in just such conflict. But it's, it's the younger people are, you know, the less developed that they are able to get in life, they're going to have mm -hmm. a, a harder time, you know, choosing, I think, because they... They, they, they don't have the maturity, you know, they never got to really accrue that much uh, maybe self-confidence or, or, you know, sense of responsibility. And so they're going to have, I think, maybe a harder time uh, choosing. And then, you know, people that just go to work every day, 
and and support you know these big corporations because it's kind of like more slow and gradual over time they're not confronted necessarily with it you know to to make these choices even though they you know they are doing it little by little every day exactly exactly um i i think uh i i think that's a uh, it's very well said about um young people and the veterans coming home i think also specifically for veterans uh they are they are trained and they are told to suck it up and that is the that's that's the worst that that is the worst so that and and of course also with this with this distorted concept of manhood you suck it up and don't be weak um to ask for help is a sign of weakness uh and so they're torn in their own heads um because also and there's a sense of if you say something different from what the mainstream is saying that somehow if you sh- if you offer any criticism of your service or of the military then you are betraying um it's a, this is a tremendous burden uh but uh on on the other side uh the burden of of grief and suffering of those families who have suffered from uh from what our military occupation has done um this is a it's it's a lose lose situation it's it's extraordinarily difficult for uh for someone to come back who's been uh who's been a part of such a rigid a uh, hierarchical system as the military to come home and then break break with it and start to speak out this is and that's why there's there aren't that mon- there aren't that many those who who are able to do that uh they they continue to to struggle with with what they're doing but that's an extraordinary step to take um and uh but but nevertheless it does happen and if there were more support for those who are opening up and saying look this is you know the emperor is naked i hate to tell you this but the emperor is naked those people need support because then they will lose and there's the fear of losing whatever little support they have left um and same thing as you said with corporate jobs uh it's not it's not in your face the bloodshed that uh that that we are responsible for um when you look at when you uh when you patronize a, a particular company or corporation uh we have to find out and you know it's it's frustrating and it's difficult to keep up with all the abuses that are involved but it's that's a lot easier than uh than actually being the one abused overseas we need to make sure that uh that uh workers are not uh working in sweatshops we need to know that uh migrant workers who are uh harvesting the crops we ne- we need to know that they are paid a living wage uh when we go to the supermarket and buy food uh and uh all along the line in every decision and, and of course we're Americans so we talk with our our credit cards and our wallets so yes. Yes. we need to figure out every step of the way support those who are doing the right thing and that again can have ripple effects out uh to uh to the rest of the the industries and uh, and to the country that's uh, i believe that we haven't seen that yet it's only been on a small scale but as more and more people are are speaking out opening up you know that there's you you find your own way to raise your voice um i have i've been very fortunate with with my big mouth uh and uh having had uh numerous opportunities to share my story and my insight and the information that i'm privy to um raising your voice does not mean the way i do it necessarily um you are hosting this show i'm sure that's just one of many ways that you're raising your voice um and and it's it it is in how you spend your money every day so it doesn't have to be it, it's you follow your own heart and you find what you're passionate about and make your difference there um that is that we still have the freedom to do that uh so i really want to again thank you for the opportunity and thank you to your listeners who are are tuning in um who have an interest in in seeking and and finding that better world so um you know i i i found uh, a shorter more condensed version of your epic speech oh, well, good <laughs> you know, but 
but still, I, I just, you know, before you go, um, I, I just want to, you know, the, the listeners to hear you just say it in plain English, what is really going on over in Iraq and what the purpose of the U.S. military, you know, what they're really doing over there, especially now that there's more talk of all these airstrikes happening in Iraq again. Well, um, in short, uh, the Iraqi people have been struggling to end uh, a military and economic and political occupation of their country since 2003. The majority of the military occupation has ended. Well, it had until Obama sent 275 special forces back in, really to protect uh, American interests and the American quote-unquote embassy. But the embassy is really CIA headquarters in Iraq. And it is through the embassy that the U.S. government continues to influence Iraqi civil society. The prime minister who is in charge now, Nouri al-Maliki, came to power in 2006 during the American occupation. What Iraq has become now is, again, uh, sort of a... Uh, it's been opened up to foreign corporations, that's corporations foreign to Iraq, mostly Western multinational corporations uh, like the oil companies, uh, like uh, other gas and, and oil companies like Halliburton and uh, other firms that got construction contracts. So we were very happy with that. At the same time, the government in Iran now had access to the religious sites of Nejef and Karbala. So Iran is happy, the Iranian government is happy, the U.S. government and its corporations are happy, and Iraqis are dying. So this is, we are being told these are terrorists, this is ISIS, it's worse than Al-Qaeda, but my message is to let's, let's find out the details. This is a legitimate rebellion. Um, ISIS is present. There are fi foreign fighters present on the ground, but they are not the main driving force of what's happening. And if we stop and think, there's only, uh, there's, we know of several thousand fighters that are part of ISIS. There's no way they can take a city the size, the size of Mosul, which is over 1.4 million people, and hold that, city, hold that city and then move on and take other cities. This is much larger than just one smaller group. There are local tribes involved, there are local militias involved, and it's the Iraqi people who are involved. Airstrikes as a, as a component of modern warfare kill people, and 90% of those who are killed are unarmed civilians. So you will never make an argument, never be able to make an argument to me that there is ever a legitimate situation for killing unarmed civilians. And of course, exactly. most of the victims are women and children because they become most susceptible to the violence of, of lack of security and kidnapping. Um, but this is this is the reality of airstrikes. Uh, to, to get in more depth, I did write an article that's online. It's called "Keep Calm and Trust Iraqis with Iraq." Um, and uh, I'm, I'm posting a lot on Facebook. I have some contacts who are in Mosul. I have other Iraqi contacts uh, in the country and, uh, and then overseas as well, um, just to get another voice, another perspective of what's happening. And uh, history has shown that our mainstream media lies to us, as does our government. So here's just one more perspective um, to look at when trying to figure out what to do. But absolutely do not bomb Iraq. Do not bomb anybody. Um, and there should be no military intervention by the United States here. And your website is called liberatethis.com. Yes, it is. It is. I apologize. It is horribly neglected. We were just talking about children and neglect and abuse, and my website is terribly neglected, but um, I am working on that, and in the meantime, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Liberate This on Twitter, and I'm on Facebook, and I have my own site. You can reach me by email, info at liberatethis.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Dahlia Waspi. Uh, yeah, you're... you're amazing your voice is amazing and I am so appreciative that you were able to join us 
And uh, so now I'm going to finally get to your this your epic speech. This is the shorter four minute version. Um, thank you. Thank you so and much. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. We have an obligation to every last victim of this illegal aggression because all of this carnage has been done in our name. Since World War II, 90% of the casualties of war are unarmed civilians, a third of them children. Our victims have done nothing to us. From Palestine to Afghanistan to Iraq to Somalia to wherever our next target may be, their murders are not collateral damage. They are the nature of modern warfare. They don't hate us because of our freedoms. They hate us because every day we are funding and committing crimes against humanity. The so-called war on terror is a cover for our military aggression to gain control of the resources of Western Asia. This is sending the poor of this country to kill the poor of those Muslim countries. This is trading blood for oil. This is genocide. And to most of the world, we are the terrorists. In these times, remaining silent on our responsibility to the world and its future is criminal. And in light of our complicity in the supreme crimes against humanity in Iraq and Afghanistan and ongoing violations of the UN Charter and international law, how dare any American criticize the actions of legitimate resistance to illegal occupation? Our so-called enemies in Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, our other colonies around the world, and our inner cities here at home are struggling against the oppressive hand of empire, demanding respect for their humanity. They are labeled insurgents or terrorists for resisting rape and pillage by the white establishment, but they are our brothers and sisters in the struggle for justice. The civilians at the other end of our weapons don't have a choice, but American soldiers have choices. And while there may have been some doubt five years ago, today we know the truth. Our soldiers don't sacrifice for duty, honor, country. They sacrifice for Kellogg, Brown, and Root. They don't fight for America. They fight for their lives and their buddies beside them because we put them in a war zone. They're not defending our freedoms. They're laying the foundation for 14 permanent military bases to defend the freedoms of ExxonMobil and British Petroleum. They're not establishing democracy, they're establishing the basis for an economic occupation to continue after the military occupation has ended. Iraqi society today, thanks to American help, is defined by house raids, death squads, checkpoints, detentions, curfews, blood in the streets, and constant violence. We must dare to speak out in support of the Iraqi people who resist and endure the horrific existence we brought upon them through our bloodthirsty imperial crusade. We must dare to speak out in support of those American war resistors, the real military heroes who uphold their oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, including those terrorist cells in Washington, D.C., more commonly known as the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. Frederick Douglass said, those who profess to favor freedom and yet appreciate education are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Every one of us, every one of us must keep demanding, keep fighting, keep thundering, keep plowing, keep speaking, keep struggling until justice is served. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Listening to Awake Radio. Straight talk for the awake and aware. Welcome back to the second hour of Organic News here on Awake Radio. So uh, I'm just going to play my recording from last night Glenn Greenwald spoke at Carnegie Hall and uh, I, I wasn't sure if 
someone said, no, you can't film, you know, they're not letting cameras, whatever. I just, I was able to just manage to have my camera out. I, I kept it a little bit low in my lap and I just recorded the entire um, talk. Glenn was introduced by Wallace Shawn, the playwright and noted stage screen actor. So uh, here is that talk by Glenn Greenwald last night at Carnegie Hall. And we can welcome Glenn Greenwald to our beloved New York City tonight. He's going to speak to us freely and uh, we're going to listen to him freely. And no one's going to arrest him for speaking tonight. <laughs> no one's going to arrest us for listening tonight. So remember that because uh, time may come when we'll look back on this delightful evening with a certain kind of nostalgia or perhaps even amazement. <laughs> Glenn has taken a risk by coming to the United States and indeed as soon as he accepted that frightening gift of documents from Edward Snowden, his life became entirely tangled up in risk. To speak briefly of myself, I, like most supposedly well-meaning middle-class New Yorkers, have avoided risk. Yes, I'll tell you that in my heart, I'm very disturbed by the status quo. I'm very worried about the crimes committed by our government. I'm very upset. And when, in the course of going about my life, I encounter people who seem to me to be not upset, people who seem to me to be complacent, I'm enraged by those people, I'm sickened by those people, I despise those people. But the truth is that during most of the hours of every day, I'm exactly like them. My behavior and my experiences are simply not affected by the things I claim to believe, and I walk around in that confused and apathetic mental fog that not merely the 1%, but I would go so far as to say that 20% primarily subsist in. To be nasty about it, you could say that people like me are not very dangerous to the status quo because we've been bought off. We've been knocked on the head and stunned by the foam rubber mallet called an agreeable life, and we're mostly out of it most of the time. Glenn, in contrast, has taken all the steps he needed to take to remove himself from the category of the stunned fog dweller. And in fact, he's living a life that his beliefs hold him into. He's surrounded by uncertainty, and for all of that, I feel we owe him respect, particularly as he's done what he's done on our behalf and for our benefit. As for the story he's recently been telling us, the story that Edward Snowden asked him to tell, it's too big and too new, really, for us to grasp all at once. What can one say? I brood a lot about the FBI's surveillance of Martin Luther King and the letter they wrote to him, suggesting to him that in order to avoid the humiliation he would face if they decided to release the tapes they made of him, his best alternative would be to commit suicide. And I think about the surveillance and harassment directed against Jean Seberg, the young actress who starred in Jean Godard's Breathless, whom the FBI hounded and tormented because she made what J. F. Hooper found to be disturbing charitable contributions, and she associated with surprising friends of different races. <laughs> Martin Luther King declined the suggestion they made to him. Jean Seberg was more fragile and apparently killed herself, though some still believe her suicide was faked. At any rate, her decomposing body was found in her car with an odd note. But, oh, 
probably the pitiful, tiny 1960s FBI. They were keeping an eye on a minuscule handful of American citizens in a handful of rooms, while the NSA's dream has been to keep an eye on everyone born into the human species anywhere on Earth. <laughs> so, have you received your NSA suicide letter yet? <laughs> no? Not yet? Well, I guess that as long as intelligent Democrats stay in power, we don't need to worry. <laughs> Man, like, <laughs> man like Obama wouldn't get involved in hurting people who haven't done anything wrong. A man like Bill Clinton wouldn't involve himself in causing harm to those who don't deserve it. Certainly anyone from my generation can confidently reassure those who are younger that intelligent Democrats, people like but George Bundy, Robert McNamara, or <laughs> Dean Morris are the sort of people humanity can trust not to use the powers they have in a way that would bring suffering to innocent people. So, as long as we keep the Republicans out of the White House, the planet has to be the fear from the NSA. <laughs> in any case, Snowden gave Glenn the documents because he'd been reading his columns for a long time, as I have been also, and many of you have. And Snowden knew that Glenn had been thinking wisely and for a long time about all the issues that matter the most. And so, in our untrustworthy world, in which so many well-meaning individuals seem to be so easily and so quickly corrupted as if by magic, Snowden decided to place his trust in Laura Poitras and ultimately in Glenn. He knew that his own life would be made either meaningful or meaningless, depending on the use Glenn made of the documents. He was betting an awful lot of his chips on a man he'd never met. Friends, I give you Glenn Greenwald. Obama administration, James Clapper, 
who got caught lying to the American people through the Senate. Um, every bit as much of a felony as anything that Edward Snowden is accused of having done. And yet, unlike Edward Snowden, uh, James Clapper, like every single national security elite and corporate elite over the last decade who has committed plainly egregious crimes, is facing no legal accountability whatsoever for his felonies, although at least he has had a rather intense year. And it has also been an intense year for President Obama as he has had to navigate the fallout from having been exposed for presiding over a rapid and aggressive expansion of the very surveillance system that he spent 2007 and 2008 vowing to rein in. It has been an intense year for Silicon Valley companies that got caught eagerly collaborating with the NSA far beyond what the law required in handing over and compromising the privacy interests of their customers. And I think above all else, it has been a actually truly intense year for numerous citizenries and populations around the world who learn for the first time that contrary to what they have been led to believe by the U.S. government, this massive sprawling surveillance system is directed not at the terrorists or other violent criminals, but instead is directed at them. And one of the reasons that I genuinely like coming to events like this um, is because it gives me an opportunity to sit back and think about the profound implications of what this story has produced. And I think one of the reasons why the intensity of this story has endured and sustained for as long as it has, the reason that a year later, more than a year later, after our first story, I'm able to travel not just around the United States, but around Latin America, where I spent the last few weeks doing this, and around Europe, where I spent three weeks prior to that, going around and having auditoriums this large and even much larger fill up with people interested in talking about and hearing about these stories, is because the debates that have been triggered around the world have been about much more than surveillance. They've really been about a wide array of at least equally profound questions. We have had, really for the first time, a serious examination about the meaning and value of privacy in the digital age. We have had a truly, I think, profound debate about the dangers of vesting government power and government factions with extraordinary authorities that they can operate in secret and specifically about the vast gap between the branding and marketing image that was sold to the world about President Obama on the one hand and the reality of who he is and what he does on the other. And I think there has been uh, probably the most enduring and sustained debate that we will have as a result of all of these revelations about the role that journalism is supposed to play in a democracy and specifically about the proper relationship between a journalist and those who wield the greatest political and corporate power. And as I said, this is really the first time going around to events like this. It's the first time that I've been able to stop doing what I've been doing for the last year, which is reporting on one story after the next, <laughs> focusing on the specifics of those revelations. What is the surveillance program that we were reporting on? What is the technological capability that has been amassed? How is it that they've been using that? We're focusing on those stories one after the other, which has had in some effect, in some sense, a, an obfuscating effect on these broader implications. And so coming around to events like this gives me a chance to sort of pause and take a step back and think about how all of those implications connect to one another. And that is probably the, one of the main reasons why I wrote this book, was to think about the implications from a broader perspective than just working on story after story permits. And the thing that I think is really important to realize about writing a book, about the process of writing a book, is that writing a book is actually a really miserable experience. Kind of noble. <laughs> it, it, I'm sure anybody who has written a book will tell you that it is soul draining and grueling and you do it in isolation. And what I've come to learn, this is the fifth book that I've written, is that there is no reason to write a book, just write a book. If you're going to write a book, you have to have a very compelling motive or set of motives to write it. And specifically, you need to have something that you think urgently needs to be said, some kind of passionate point that you think can only be made in the form of a book. And one of the principal reasons that I wrote this book, aside from the opportunity to connect all of these thoughts, is that so much has been said over the last year in major American media outlets about 
what Edward Snowden did, about the reporting that we've done, about what these documents reveal, the vast majority of which is just completely wrong. It is just factually false. And if you are somebody who loves to bash American, the American media or to talk about how awful American journalists are, and I am somebody who loves to do that. That's like one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Uh, you, it, it won't come as a surprise to you to, to realize and to hear that enormous amounts of what the establishment American media disseminates in their most authoritative and certain tone is actually just completely false. And so one of the things I want to do is just examine several of the most significant falsehoods that have been disseminated over the last year about this story. Not so much to talk about why they're false, although I will do that briefly, but more because I think they really reveal so much about how our political and media discourse function. So the first myth or the first falsehood that I want to talk about is one that I've certainly heard over and over and over again. In fact, you can barely turn on any kind of serious television program or Sunday morning show or read one of America's leading newspapers about this story without hearing all sorts of people say this. In fact, usually it's the consensus, which is that Edward Snowden is a Russian spy. This is something that just gets said over and over and over again. It's probably the leading claim made by those who want to discredit the reporting and malign them as a source. And what was really interesting to me, and actually kind of amazing to me about the process of writing this book, is back in June of 2013, I was a little bit preoccupied with Hong Kong. I was blissfully ignorant of what most American pundits and American media figures were saying about the stories that we were doing. And it was only when I wrote the book that I went back and looked at what was being said contemporaneously. And what I saw when I went and did that was something really stunning to me, which is that the very same people who have spent the last year claiming, not speculatively, but claiming to have certainty that Edward Snowden is an operative of the Russian government, back in June 2013, they were saying something much different, because in June of 2013, Edward Snowden was in Hong Kong and not in Moscow. It was before he left Hong Kong and flew to Moscow. And what they were saying then, the very same people is, and you can go back and look at them saying this is, Oh, I mean, what's going on here is extremely obvious. I mean, Edward Snowden is a Chinese spy. <laughs> this is an operation being run out of Beijing. To the point where, you know, when he got on that plane and flew to Moscow, almost instantly this accusation just so seamlessly morphed into the claim that he was a Russian spy without any acknowledgement that they were saying something radically different just weeks earlier. To the point where I am literally 100% certain that if somehow Edward Snowden managed tomorrow to escape Moscow and flew to, you know, just pick like a random city, like he just flew to Abu Dhabi. Nima. That's the first thing. <laughs> I used Abu Dhabi three days, three days ago, so I just keep myself a little interested. So I'll say Lima. Um, overnight, instantly, there'd be this consensus that, oh, I mean, obviously, all along, Edward Snowden was a Peruvian spy. I mean, this is something so obvious. In fact, my favorite example of how this dynamic functions came about a month ago in the Wall Street Journal. There was an op-ed by this person named Edward J. Epstein, who's this. He's one of those people who just like sort of toils every day in the dank underbelly of Washington think tank culture, and every now and then they kind of pull him up and he emerges to go on America's meeting and taking journal pages and spew some sort of pro-government propaganda and then he like descends back into his little <laughs> life. And this, what he said in this op-ed was really amazing. It was about a month ago. I just actually want to read the verbatim quote because it's probably my favorite quote of the last year. It's from May 10, 2014 from the Wall Street Journal. He wrote, and this is an actual quote, he said, he had just spoken with a former Obama cabinet member, and he was told the following, quote, there are only three possibilities for the Snowden Heights. The Snowden Heights. Only three possibilities. Just you have the three possibilities. And I'm really quoting. One, it was a Russian espionage operation. Two, it was a Chinese espionage <laughs> operation. Or three, it was a joint Sino-Russian operation. <laughs> And, you know, obviously the translation of that into honest English is we have absolutely no idea who Edward Snowden is or what he did, but we will say anything we need to to malign him. 
Now, this claim that he's a Russian spy or was a Chinese spy was not just unpersuasive, but was so self-evidently wrong by all available information that nobody should have been able to stand up and say it with a straight face. I mean, there's just so much evidence that demonstrates that, beginning with the fact that when he was in Hong Kong, the reason he left was because the Chinese government told him that he was forced to leave or else they would hand him over to the Americans. Not really the typical treatment that the government in Beijing extends to Chinese spies. And now he was in Moscow, he spent five weeks in the international transit zone of the Moscow International Airport while Vladimir Putin's government negotiated with the Americans over what they might get in benefits in exchange for handing Snowden over to the American government, not really the typical treatment that Vladimir Putin extends to Russian spies. But the most compelling evidence that demonstrates how self-evidently absurd this claim is and always has been is that he never chose to be in Russia in the first place. He was simply intending to transit through on his way to Havana and then ultimately on to Ecuador where he intended to seek asylum. And he was trapped in Russia, forced by the U.S. government to be there, when on the plane ride from Hong Kong to Moscow, they unilaterally revoked his passport. Did you, by the way, even know that the U.S. government has that power? They can just one day wake up. No charges, no due process, no notice, no hearing, nothing. They just say, we hereby decree that your passport is from hence this point forward invalid. And if you are outside of the country, you become stateless and trapped. And that is what happened to him. And in addition, they bully the Cubans into rescinding the offer of safe passage that they had extended. So what really happened was the U.S. government first forced him to be trapped in Moscow. They physically prevented him from leaving. And then they had their apologists and defenders and loyalists in the media turn around and use the fact that he was in Russia as proof that he was a Russian spy. <laughs> and then there's the fact that there's all sorts of things that if he were motivated by espionage motives, he could have done with this archive. Just think about that. He could have easily sold it for tens of millions of dollars to multiple intelligence agencies around the world. Or he could have covertly passed it to America's adversaries. He did none of that. This was a classic case of somebody undertaking an act of conscience. What he did is exactly what we want any whistleblower to do, which is to come to journalists whom he trusted and to say, I don't want to make a decision about which of this material ought to be publicly disclosed. I'm giving this to you and I want you to vet it carefully and publish that which is necessary to inform my fellow citizens, by which he means not just Americans, but the other 95% of the planet who are not Americans. He said, I want you to inform them of what they should know about what is being done to their privacy while never endangering any innocent life. And what he told me after I spent many, many hours with him, both prior to getting to Hong Kong and then once I was there, about why it is that he did what he did. I spent a long time trying to understand why a 29-year-old with a lucrative career and a girlfriend who loved him and a family who supported him and his whole life ahead of him would unravel all of that and sacrifice it all and undertake a course of action that would almost certainly put him into prison, an American prison, no less, for the rest of his life in pursuit of a political principle. And what he ultimately told me and convinced me of, and I'm convinced of it to this day, is that the reason that he did what he did is because once he confronted what he perceived as this injustice and knew that he had an opportunity to do something about it, the pain of having it rest on his conscience for the rest of his life, the knowledge that he could have done something and did, was so much worse than anything the U.S. government could have done to him in retaliation, including putting him into prison for the rest of his life. It was the classic act of self-sacrifice and an act of conscience. And what I find so fascinating about this frenzy on the part of media elites and political elites to search for the concealed nefarious motive, it really is revealing that that effort says so much, but it says nothing at all about the target of those accusations, Edward Snowden, it reveals an enormous amount though, about the people who are making those accusations. Mm -hmm. The reason that so many media and political elites cannot believe that he was motivated by true political conviction is because they themselves have no political convictions. <laughs> Can't believe it. Can't believe it. Can't believe it. 
anybody could possibly engage in an act of self-sacrifice because careerist advancement and self-aggrandizement is the only thing that motivates them. And so they automatically assume that the same affliction of soullessness that plagues them must necessarily plague other people. And that really is what drives the effort to not only disbelieve the nobility of the acts of Edward Snowden, but pretty much every whistleblower and dissenter that ever emerges in the United States. So I just want to talk about a related myth that has been propagated over the last year, one that actually does relate quite a bit to that one, um, although it really, I think, is revealing in its own ways. And this is the claim, and again, I'm sure you've heard this over and over and over again. I certainly have. The claim is that Edward Snowden did what he did because he is a fame-seeking narcissist. <laughs> and what, again, amazed me about this is when I went back and looked at the discourse in the United States and the immediate aftermath of our stories and of our revealing him as our source was what shocked me was how instantaneous was the rush by all sorts of pundits clinging to this very same script. You know, if you had told me two or three years ago that you were somebody who thought that there was some kind of messaging, centralized messaging disseminated to American media figures and that's what they get, where they get their messaging and they go forth and repeat it and that explains why they essentially end up saying the same thing as, all of them, uh, as, as each other. I would have been really skeptical about that. I would have said, no, I actually don't think that that is what explains it. I think they're basically just kind of mindless hurting So they just sort of mimic the behavior that they see other people engaged in. And then that's what they do. You don't even need to coordinate the messaging. It's not even necessary. It's actually redundant. <laughs> but the speed with which they clung to this really specific idiosyncratic script, fame seeking narcissists, if you Google it, you'll find it over and over, almost made me reconsider my skepticism about that theory. We unveiled Edward Snowden as our source on June 10th. And within 48 hours, literally, a whole variety of pundits, the New York Times columnist David Brooks, and Bob Schaefer, the host of Face the Nation, and Richard Cohen, the Washington Post, oh. and uh, Jeffrey Tubin, the CNN. Oh. Um, they all instantly decided that they were capable of diagnosing, like clinically diagnosing, this person that they didn't know and had never met yes. as suffering from the psychological disorder of narcissism. I mean, it was just amazing how rapidly that, that script of attack and demonization emerged. Now, again, just like with the idea that he's a Russian spy, the, all the evidence in the world disproves that claim, that illustrates really conclusively how ludicrous it is. The very first conversation that I ever had with Edward Snowden, which was on the internet when I was in Brazil and he was in Hong Kong, and I knew absolutely nothing about him. I didn't know his name, his age, his anything in demographics, his race, even his gender. All I knew is that he had told me by this point that he wanted to give me a large number of top secret documents that incriminated the NSA and the spying activities they were engaged in. What he said to me in that very first conversation was, he said, I want you to understand something about which I am in fact. In fact, I am completely resolute about it to the point where I will not even entertain the debates about it. He said, I absolutely intend to come forward and at the beginning of the story, not at the end, and publicly identify myself as the source for these documents. And he said, I intend to do that for two separate reasons. First, he said, I believe I just owe an obligation to the public if I'm going to do something that has an impact on this number of people to account for what it is that I've done, to explain why it is that I did it. And secondly, he said, I don't think I've done anything wrong. In fact, quite the opposite. I think that what I've done is absolutely right, and I don't therefore intend to lurk in the darkness or to hide or to scamper away as though I've done something shameful. I intend to come forward proudly and to say, this is who I am, this is where I am, this is what I did, and this is why I did it. But, he told me, the minute that I come and publicly identify myself, I intend to disappear from the media spot. I will not be interviewed, I will not let people examine me personally, I will not talk to any journalist. And the reason he said he intends to disappear that way is because he wanted to make sure that none of the attention 
was put on to him, but instead was put on what he just has unraveled his life to reveal, which is the substance of what these documents demonstrate about what the NSA is doing to all of our privacy. And good to his word, he refused to give any interviews. In fact, every single day, literally for like four or five months after we first unveiled him as the source, I had every single big TV star. You know what? Okay, that's the end of the first half an hour. So here comes the second. <laughs> calling me every single day, pleading with me to arrange an interview with Edward Snowden. He could have been on prime time television every single night. He could have been the most famous person in the world easily. He was by far the biggest yet at the time in all of not just American news, but global news. And yet he purposely removed himself from the spotlight, did not want any attention on him, and wanted all the attention instead on the story. I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, but that does not to me seem like the behavior of a fame-seeking narcissist. <laughs> and, and yet, we can hear every single day the same claim being repeated. To this day, I don't think there's a day that goes by where I don't confront the claim that Snowden is a, a, a narcissist. And I think there's two fascinating things about this attack that are, are really worth thinking. One is that it is the same attack that gets made on every single whistleblower and every single real dissenter, the person who engages in meaningful dissent. And by meaningful dissent, I don't mean like MSNBC kind of dissent, where you like stand up and say, I don't really like this party, but this party is really great, you should go and vote for them. <laughs> That's the kind of permissible political activism that stays well within the bounds of what is not dissent. By meaningful dissent, I mean confronting injustices that you believe are so profound and radical within a system that has become so corrupted that your only choice to meaningfully resist that injustice is to break the law. That's what I mean by meaningful dissent or radical dissent. Every single time there's a whistleblower or a radical dissident who comes forward with the same sorts of personality and psychological attacks are made against them. When I was growing up, one of my big political heroes was Dave And I, I admired him for all the reasons that everybody else does, including obviously a lot of you. And yet there was always one thing that completely mystified me about the Pentagon kind of Papers case. It really confounded me. I genuinely couldn't figure it out, which was this. In response to what Daniel Ellsberg revealed in the Pentagon Papers, the tactic in response by the Nixon administration was to break into the office of his psychoanalyst in order to obtain as many psychosexual secrets of Daniel Osborne's as they could. And the reason this genuinely mystified me for so long was because it seemed like the ultimate non separator to me. You know, like, the headlines were, leaked documents show that the United States government has been systematically lying to the American population about the Vietnam War for a decade. And in response, the Nixon administration was going to say, well, Daniel Ellsberg is a slinger and he has like some unnatural affection for his sister that he has to resolve in therapy or something. And I couldn't figure out why they thought that would be effective. I mean, it was just an obvious non sequitur. And one of the great honors that I've had over the last decade in writing about politics is I've gotten to become friends with Daniel Ellsberg and he's a colleague of mine we co-founded a group, Freedom of the Press Foundation, on, on whose board we both sit. And I actually, the very first time I ever met him was here in New York, and I had the opportunity to ask him about that. I said, why did the Nixon administration think this ultimate non sequitur was going to be an effective way to attack you? And what he said to me was, he said, you are thinking about this way too rationally. <laughs> <laughs> That just is not how human beings interact with the world, psychologically and mentally and emotionally. And what he explained turned out, in retrospect, to be so completely true. You can see this emerge every single time there's another whistleblower. What he explained to me was that if you can take somebody who has meaningfully descended from the prevailing order and depict them as psychologically disturbed, as mentally ill, as guilty of something deeply shameful, 
Yes. You not only distract from the substance of the revelations that they've made, although you definitely do that, but something much more important is going on, which is that you make that person so radioactive that nobody wants to have anything to do with them, to be associated with them in any way. You just want to distance yourself from not just them, but everything that they're connected with, including the things that they've exposed. It just becomes this very kind of unpleasant thing that you just want to bury. Because to go near it is to confront something deeply unpleasant. And this really is the tactic that's used over and over and over again. I think the most compelling example that I've ever seen was in 2010, when WikiLeaks had given the New York Times what was undoubtedly one of the most important set of revelations in many years of non-American history, which were the Iraq War Logs. They were actually more important than the Iraq and Afghanistan War Logs. And what these Iraq War Logs showed was system, systematic atrocities by the United States government and the Iraqi security forces that they were training, all done with widespread authorization. Not just thousands of civilian deaths that were previously unknown, but systematic torture taking place in detention camps, all kinds of human rights abuses of the most egregious kind that were previously unknown. It provided probably the most visceral glimpse into the reality of American war making that our country has ever had. And if you look at the way the New York Times reported that story uh, in October 2010, they had one article on their front page that was about the documents, and it was, of course, it didn't say anything like new documents reveal American war crimes because the New York Times leaked uh, jargon, the United States doesn't commit war crimes up for other countries. It said something like new documents shed light on the Iraq war or something. Something really boring and, and, and un unnotable. And then right next to it, given greater prominence than the substance of the revelations themselves was a story by the New York Times pro-war reporter John Burns that was intended to depict Julian Assange as this sort of paranoid freak. And the headline was something like, WikiLeaks founder on the run, his notoriety chasing him. And it was intended to make you feel like anything that had to do with WikiLeaks was something you just wanted to stay away from because of how freakish and paranoid and mentally ill its founder was. It said things like, Julian Assange is so paranoid that he actually sends somebody, he's walking down the street, he sends somebody ahead to the intersection to make sure that nothing or nobody is lurking there. And I don't know, I mean, at the time, Julian Assange was involved in the greatest national security league in American history. For me, thinking that there may be somebody working on the corner is actually a sign of rationality, not paranoid. Exactly. But to the New York Times, they wanted me to think that that showed how insane he was. They talked about how he, his clothes were dirty, and he smelled, and he stayed on the couches of friends. And two weeks after that revelation, which was incredibly beneficial to the New York Times, Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times, broke this huge story about Julian Assange. He revealed in his column, for having worked with Julian, that Julian Assange washes his socks so rarely that they're actually dirty enough that they bunch up around his ankles and will not even stay up when he pulls them to his knees. <laughs> this was really intended to make people look at not just Julian Assange, but the kind of descent in which he engages as evidence of some kind of disorder. The same thing was done with the other generation's greatest whistleblower, Chelsea Manning. <laughs> were very, very hard to depict her as motivated by what they were calling her struggles with her gender disorder or her very difficult relationship with her father. And yet, if you look at the chats in which she engaged when she thought nobody was listening, when she was talking to the person who ultimately became her informant to the government, what she says is very similar to what almost every whistleblower has said, which is she joined the a U.S. Army and went to fight in Iraq because she thought that her government was doing good in the world and she felt patriotic and wanted to support that effort. And yet over time she discovered that her government was actually engaged in heinous abuses and she could not have it rest on her conscience, just like Edward Snowden said, knowing that she could have done something about that and didn't. And then she released these documents because as she said, she wanted to trigger worldwide debate and ultimately reform. Now, whatever you think about her, that is the model of rational thinking, and yet it was crucial to depict her as this person who was mentally unstable because that was the way that we all would just sort of look away. It's a really powerful practice.
But there's this other premise embedded in this framework that's even more subtle and ultimately, I think, more insidious, more powerful. And that is that the reason that every time a whistleblower or a dissenter emerges, we instantly start searching for their psychological motives is because the assumption that we have is that only dissent from the prevailing order is driven by psychological motives. That's the only choice that raises the question of what is psychologically causal. Equating dissent with mental illness has a really long and nefarious history. But it also has this powerful premise to it, which is that dissenting by itself is evidence of mental illness because the status quo is just so fundamentally good <laughs> that the only reason, the only way you could possibly reach the conclusion that it is so radically unjust that it merits that level of defiance is if you yourself are mentally ill and then therefore perceive the world through a prism of mental illness. But the more powerful converse to that is that psychological health is by definition demonstrated by acquiescing to the prevailing order, by compliance with it. And what this framework does, the reason that it's so insidious, is that there is a really crucial debate that we need to be having, that this framework is intended to obfuscate, really intended to resolve without even acknowledging that the debate exists. And that debate is this, it centers around this question. What is really the mentally healthy course of action? If you are working within this sprawling secret surveillance state and discover what is being done to people's privacy without their knowledge, is it to continue to work within it and conceal it and perpetrate it, or is it to come forward and inform the world about what's being done so that they can debate it? Or what is the mentally healthy course of action if you're working within this sprawling military empire, this massive national security state, and you learn of human rights abuses and atrocities, or you learn that your government is systematically misleading and deceiving your own population for a decade about the winability of the war? Is it to continue to work within it and conceal it and help perpetrate that, or is it to come forward and disclose the information that journalists can then use to trigger the debate and strengthen the democracy that we all claim to believe in. I think that that is the crucial debate that we ought to be having, and it's precisely because we need to be having this debate. So I just want to talk about one last myth, um, which has persisted for a full year now, even though there's absolutely no basis, basis for it. And that is the following, and I'm certain that you've all heard this many, many times, which is the reason that government officials in the United States have, just, have decided to construct and then expand this massive surveillance system that is ubiquitous and directed at everybody is because they have this extremely compelling, almost uncontrollable need, yeah. desire, to protect all of you from really dangerous things and to keep you safe, especially from all of those terrorists who want to do things like blow off the auditorium in which we're currently gathered. <laughs> now, I, can, you know, I have a really cynical view of American political discourse that probably doesn't surprise me, and I guess there's a lot of you do too. And yet, even through that cynicism, I actually am shocked that after the last year of revelation, People are able to stand up in public and make that claim with a straight face without having their credibility instantly and permanently obliterated. And the reason I say that is because there is so much evidence that proves that the surveillance system that has been constructed has nothing whatsoever to do with any of that. From specific discrete programs like spying on the personal communication of democratically elected leaders of our allies, such as the President of Brazil, Bill Rousseff, or the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, or spying on oil companies or regional economic conferences, or putting entire populations in Western Europe by the hundreds of millions under a surveillance microscope, things that so plainly have nothing to do with terrorism and all sorts of things to do with economic advantage and just general power. But the much more compelling evidence that proves just how absurd that claim is, that this is what the system is about, are the NSA's own documents, which, as luck would have it, and this is probably something you already know, I happen to have many tens of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> and 
You know, the NSA comes in for a lot of criticism and a lot of bashing, but sometimes they actually do deserve credit and deserve our gratitude. And I think it's important to acknowledge when that's the case. And the NSA does actually earn my gratitude and I think does deserve a lot of credit. Because so many of the documents that they created, albeit when they thought nobody was looking, are incredibly clear and helpful in understanding what they really are about. <laughs> the, the motto of this agency, it's motto, like groups have mottos to define what they are, you know, nations sometimes have motto. The NSA's motto, its motto is collected all. <laughs> it is. That is really its motto. It's not collected some or collected terrorist communications, but you can collect a lot of it. It's collected all. And there's this one document that I just published in the book and put online at the same time, simultaneously with the book's publication, that's even more helpful and elaborates on this mission. It says, and this is a really helpful, clear title, it says, Our Collection Posture. It's a document. Yeah, I say, this is what our collection posture is. And then at the bottom of that is a circle with six phrases that define their collection posture. And at the top it says, collect it all. And then there's these other phrases that go around counterclockwise and you go around the circle that says, process it all, snip it all, <laughs> exploit it all, partner it all, know it all. Know it all. That is the institutional mandate of the NSA. They collect billions of telephone calls and emails every single day from telecommunications and internet systems around the world, multiple countries, including our own. They really are an agency, and this is without hyperbole, devoted to the elimination of privacy in the digital age. And I don't mean that melodramatically. They literally intend and are very close to achieving a system that collects and stores every single communication event, finding between every human being on the planet that takes place electronically, meaning on the telephone or by the internet. It is the greatest and most impressive and most pervasive system of suspicionless surveillance ever created in human history. And what amazes me about the fact that there's still an ongoing debate about even that question is just how incredibly conclusive their own documents were. I, about six weeks ago, was in Toronto, where I debated the former head of the NSA, CIA, Michael Hayden, who was the director of both of those agencies under George Bush. And it was really interesting because in this debate, this is before my book was published, so those documents weren't yet available, and he stood up before I spoke, and he did exactly what I knew he was going to do, and I've seen him do so many times what Keith Alexander does and what they all do, which is, God, I come up with some really grandfatherly but serious things, like the serious grandfather. Um, and he said, you know, look, I have kids, I have grandkids. And, you know, like you, I mean, we're really struggling to keep them safe. And this is a really hard thing to do. And then he said, but, you know, on the other hand, we are Americans. We love life. We love the Constitution. And it's really important for us to the as well. And then he said, and that's why so much of these myths have been trying to convince you that we're out there, you know, collecting everything. We're collecting your phone calls and emails and your hands down the street, and everybody else is in reality, that's just not the case. We're only interested in collecting the terrorist communications. Okay. And so I was so happy. I barely could keep myself in my sleep. <laughs> and I jumped up and I was like, you know what? I have these documents. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I talked about the stuff, the fuck it all stuff, and I talked about how that was some motto, and I went through that whole circle thing. Um, and then they're like, okay, well, what's your response? Then I'll hate it. And what can you say? And so he said, you know, I think it's really important to understand when we say collect it all, we don't mean collect it all. <laughs> And the talk about mental illness. I genuinely believe I think that we can have a debate about whether we want the government to be engaged in a system where building a system where they collect every single person's last communication event. But the fact that we are still having a debate about whether they're doing that, I think, really underscores just how rotten, genuinely rotten, our resources. Yeah. So I want to talk about one more uh, reason that I, I was genuinely happy and enthusiastic about writing this book, um, which was I really wanted the opportunity to do a comprehensive discussion and examination about the reason that privacy is such a crucial human value. Woo! 
and this is not, it's not actually an easy discussion to have. It's not an easy argument to make. The reason it's not an easy argument to make is because a lot of people, understandably so, look at a lot of other values as being much more immediate and visible, such as having a job, and feeding their kids, and having health care. And privacy tends to be thought of even by people who value it as something somehow more remote and more abstract. And the argument that gets made typically by people who seek to dismiss the value of privacy is one that we've all heard so many times. And it essentially boils down to this line of thinking. The, the, the argument really amounts to this. There are two types of people in the world, broadly speaking. There are the good people and then there are the bad people. The bad people have things to hide. They need privacy because they're doing things like calling the ball off on like the one we were gathered. I'm sorry to keep using that example, but I'm really <laughs> when we had that monk debate said, there are the terrorists out there who want to literally go off the auditorium in which we're gathered. So it's just <laughs> <laughs> And we get too close to Alan so it's his voice will not leave your head for <laughs> um, But what they'll say is there are these bad people here and they, they actually don't, they care about privacy because they're doing bad things and they want to hide them. But I am a good person. I'm not intending to do bad things. And therefore, I don't have anything to hide, so I actually don't mind. I'm not worried if the government is reading my emails or listening to my telephone calls. I don't care if people know what it is that I'm doing, because I'm not doing bad things. This mindset was expressed in its purest and I think most repugnant form by the longtime CEO of Google, Eric Schirr, who gave an interview in 2008 by a pretty uh, aggressive reporter. This reporter kept trying to press him on the threat posed of privacy by his company, Google. He kept asking him, what about all of the incredibly invasive information and things that people can learn about private individuals as a result of what your company has made available? And Eric Schmidt finally put on this sort of like sneering tone and he said, well, you know what? If you're doing things or saying things that you don't want other people to know about, that's pretty good evidence that you probably shouldn't be doing them. Now, this was the same Eric Schmidt, but less than a year later, less than a year later, ordered every single employee of Google to stop talking to the online digital magazine CNET because CNET had published this profile of Eric Schmidt that had all this really personal probing in the basement picture that they got from Google just to be able to search it. I think the chat reaction underscores this vital point that so often gets lost in the debate. You can actually test it yourself, which is this. The people, whether they're your friends, your family members, people you hear on television or whomever, people who say that they don't care about their privacy, that they don't care about hiding what it is they're doing because they're doing nothing wrong, they don't actually believe that. They don't. They don't believe that. And I have the proof of that. These same people who say that they don't care about their privacy, they put passwords on their email and their social media accounts. And they put locks and they use locks on their bedroom and their bathroom doors. And they do all sorts of things to keep what they're doing hidden. And there's a good reason for that, which is that we all know that there's really good reasons why we all create privacy. In fact, I have gone around the world now for a year debating privacy, even longer. But over the last year, every single time one of those people has said to me, whether it be like at events like this, where they come up to me afterwards, or they email me, or they say it on TV, or in speeches, or whatever, where they say, I'm not one of the bad people, and not doing anything wrong, I don't actually care if people know what it is that I'm doing, this is what I say to them. I get a pen, I get a piece of paper out, and I write down my email address, and I give it to them, and I say, here's my email address. What I want you to do when you get home is email me all of the passwords your email and your social media accounts so that I can just read through everything that you're doing online, everything that you're talking to people about, everything that people are sending you, and just post whatever it is that I feel like under your name. And look, you have no reason not to do this because you're not doing anything wrong to so you. You have nothing to hide. Not one person. <laughs> Literally not one person. I, mean, I check that email address all the time, like obsessively, and it's a very lonely and desolate place. Nobody ever you know, there was this really interesting um, event that took place in July of 2013 after we had reported that the NSA is collecting 
the metadata, what they call the metadata, of every single American. And by metadata, they mean they're collecting the list of all the people who you're calling, who are calling you, and who are sending you emails and who you're emailing you, and how long you communicate, and where it is you are when you communicate. And in response to that revelation, the NSA's best, best friend in the entire United States Congress, really their best friend in all Washington, D.C., the indescribably heinous senator from California, Diane Pike. Sorry. <laughs> and um, I'm going to assume you're clapping for the indescribably heinous description. <laughs> Anyone clapping for Diane Pike saying would be a bad villain, you wouldn't vote about So, you know, I, she wrote this op ed in, in, the, in USA Today. And if you haven't seen it, you should really go read it. It is, it's like the peak of brazen political propaganda. She says is, not only do I not understand why people are upset that we're collecting their metadata, I don't even think that this should even be called spying. It's not even spying because we're not reading the content of anybody's emails or listening to the uh, conversations they're having on the telephone. We're simply collecting the list of all the people who everybody in the entire country, all 300 million of people, are talking to every single day and every moment. Now, Leave aside the fact that that was literally deceitful. It was just a lie. The U.S. government constantly reads the emails and listens to the telephone calls of American citizens without warnings. Think about how invasive it is for somebody to know what they call your metadata. Think about what it is that they can learn about you and know about you by knowing every single person with whom you communicate. If you are a woman who calls an abortion or somebody who calls a physician specializing in HIV treatment, or you call an alcohol or drug addiction center, or a suicide hotline, or you speak with somebody frequently late at night who isn't your spouse, they will know everything, the most intimate details, have a complete picture about your life, and not just your life, but the life of everybody with whom you're communicating as well. And so in response to this op-ed from Diane Feinstein, there arose this amazingly instant social media movement that asked Diane Feinstein every single day at the end of her workday so she doesn't think it's an invasion of privacy to post online a list of all the people with whom she had communicated by telephone or down in person that day. And of course she would never do it. And the reason no one will do that, including the people who say that they have nothing to hide and don't value privacy, is because we all understand on a deeply visceral and instinctive level why it is that we need a place that we can go in the world to think and to speak and to explore and to choose and to be without any judgmental eyes being cast upon us. There is mountains of social science evidence, but I think even more compelling is our own personal experience that really vividly teaches that lesson, which is that when we think we are being watched by other people, the range of behavioral choices that we have dramatically reduces. Human beings, when they think they're being watched, engage in much more compliant and conformist behavior. The desire to avoid social condemnation and shame and judgment is embedded within us. It's how society is formed. And so a person who believes that they're being watched is a person who will engage in Conformity. A society that is being watched is a society that will be conformist. That's the reason governments universally love surveillance power, because it keeps people in line by putting a prison in their own brain about the range of choices that they have. It is only in a private realm, only in a world in which, a realm in which we know that we can act without others watching, do things like dissent and creativity and personal exploration. It is in that realm where those things exclusively reside. And so a world in which we have an agency like the NSA devoted to the elimination of privacy in the digital age, which is their goal, is a world in which human freedom and individual choice will shrink dramatically to the point of being invisible. And you can stop a lot. It's easy to do at the people who say, I have nothing to hide because I'm doing nothing wrong, and therefore I don't care about privacy. But there's actually a really odious implication to allowing that mindset to take root. In a world in which we all believe that the only reason to value privacy is because we are doing bad things that we want to hide, 
That is a world in which anyone who seeks privacy, by definition, will become suspicious. And in the NSA's word of mind, and in the mind of the US government, that is how they think. They look for people, for example, who use encryption on their email based on the premise that if you are somebody who wants to hide what you're saying from them, then it probably means, as Eric Schmidt said, that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and ought to be regarded with suspicion. But there's another, I think, even deeper aspect to this idea of, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, and therefore I have nothing to hide, and don't mind if the government made my privacy. And it took me actually a long time to figure out what this was. It, it sort of worked in my mind for a long time. And the first time that it ever kind of entered my mind, I remember really clearly, um, was in June of 2013, after the first week of the NSA reporting that I did, where I did four different stories, and then unveiled that it was known as the source, and then I did a bunch of interviews, one of which was with the MSNBC. Okay, so that was an hour of Glenn Greenwald last night at Carnegie Hall. There is about 17 minutes left of the talk that, uh, if you want to watch the rest of it, it's on my YouTube channel, April, like the month before May, and last name Waters, W-A-T-T-E-R-S. Um, before I tune out, I just wanted to comment about what Glenn Greenwald was just talking about, and I was really, really happy that he uh, discussed and made the points that he was making because these are so many of the points that I try to make when I write my blogs and, you know, just everything, uh, you know, related to psychology and health and fitness that I've been studying my whole life which is so, so important, and it comes all back down to debt. So, right, what the, you know, I just call them the powers that be, try to make our healthy need for privacy. Everything is about healthy amounts, and they want to make our healthy amount of, of our needs, our self-expression, so whether it's privacy or dissent or protesting, or just any kind of self-expression, criminal, terrorist, while they, the ones who have all the secrecy, who have zero transparency, who have everything in, you know, monumental sociopathological amounts, you know, like, like, right, so, you know, the, the mentally ill ones are calling the healthy ones mentally ill. So this is what I mean about exercise. If we do not exercise our healthy needs, expressions, and drives, the mentally ill ones are going to be more and more taking our health and getting more and more psychotic. So we have to really, really, you know, hold on to what we have, what's rightfully ours. Your privacy is what's rightfully yours. Your dissent is, is your rightful healthy amount. Not psychos telling you that your healthy amount is mentally ill or terrorist. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And I thank you for tuning in. And please tune in again next week, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on this Organic News